Good morning, St. Matthew's Cathedral. I'm so glad you joined us for worship today. And uh, our opening hymn is hymn number 182. Hymn number 182. Christ is alive, let Christians sing. His cross stands empty to the sky. Let streets and homes with praises ring. His love in death shall never die. Christ is alive, no longer bound to distant years in Palestine. He comes to claim the here and now and conquer every place and time. Not throned above, remotely high, untouched, unmoved by human things, the daily in the midst of life, our Savior with the Father reigns. In every insult, rift, and war, where color scorn or wealth divide, he suffers still, yet loves no more. And with the ever crucified. Christ is alive, his spirit burns through this and every future age. Till all create shall his and lens, his joy, his. Justice, love, and praise. Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brother, should, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. 
And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those, so those who welcomed this message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 116, verses 1 to, 6, uh, 1 to 3, and then 10 to 17. It's found on page 759 of the Book of Common Prayer. Psalm 116, verses 1 to 3, and 10 to 17. We'll read it in unison. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. A reading from Peter, 1 Peter. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you are ransomed from the feudal ways of inherit, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You've been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. On the first day of the week, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? 
Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Then they told what happened to them on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So a good story requires a resolution, right? It requires some sort of sense of completion that all the various threads have been tied together and everything, you know, kind of the, the, the good guys have won or whatever the story is going to be. You have to kind of know what has happened. Imagine a series like, for example, the Harry Potter series, for those of you who read those books. Imagine if the series ended on after book six and not with book seven, right? You know, you what if you ended the story with Dumbledore, you know, spoiler alert, but it with Dumbledore just having been killed and Harry and his friends uh, aren't sure how to proceed and it looks like Voldemort is going to win and nothing has been done about the, the you know, to stop the triumph of evil and that was it. You would have a natural sense of, kind of almost a yearning to have the story come to a conclusion like it does in book seven, where you even get to see that Harry and Hermione and Ron, they have children who then go off to Hogwarts. It's a very fitting conclusion to the whole story. You kind of want to know what happens to them after the kind of after it all is settled. And you think of a, a more, you know, kind of a popular movie version also of the Avengers series, right? And at the end of Aveng the movie Avengers Infinity War, right? What if the whole thing had ended after that movie and not with Avengers Endgame, significantly titled, right? It's the endgame because it's the end. It tied all the loose strands of the story together. It kind of completed the story arcs of so many of the characters and in the end, Evil is defeated. Actually, I think Avengers Endgame is a profoundly Christian story. There's a whole bunch in there, but basically, you know, there's a new creation at the end of at the at the end of the Avengers movie, right? It's like all those who have been have were lost in the movie before, you know, who were kind of were banished and uh, and lost to their friends. They all come back. In a final, you know, and they join those who are still alive in a final confrontation against Thanos, which Greek for death, right? In a confrontation with death itself, and death is defeated, right? And then we all know how kind of how everybody kind of goes, and you know, and uh, at the end of the story. But if it had ended with Infinity War, you never would have known about how those who had been lost were to be restored you would simply have a, a profound sense of loss. And uh, it seemed like evil had won. Well, that's kind of how, in a sense, the Israelites were waiting for their story as a people to be completed by God's power. They were waiting in Second Temple Jerusalem, in the days of Jesus, they were waiting for God to finish their story. They knew that life as they knew it was not a satisfactory resolution to the tensions of their lives. Their story had not yet reached a satisfactory arc, the arc that they had been trained to expect, that is the triumph of God's life and love in the world. They weren't seeing it yet, right? 
and they were waiting for someone to show us, to show them that victory. And this is, in a sense, what Luke, here at the end of his gospel, at the end of chapter 24, the story of Emmaus is really Luke bringing all of that, the story of Israel and the story of humanity, humanity's redemption by a loving God, to a satisfactory conclusion. So there were two stories in particular in Israel's past that needed to be resolved, right? And both of them find a resolution here in the journey to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. The first one is the story of Genesis chapter 3, right? In Genesis chapter 3, you know, God in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God creates a beautiful world and he sets Adam and Eve into the middle of it to be there to be the world's steward to live in peace and joy and intimacy with God and uh, to enjoy God and the creation in total perfection and in, in the purity of life and love which is God's intention Genesis 3 is, in Genesis 3 they rebel against God's intention right and they are cast out of that perfect creation and live in a, in a kind of in an exile in their own lives. They're still in the creation, but they're, they don't enjoy it, right? In, in the, 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 the sentence that God imposes is that from now on, instead of just enjoying the creation, you're going to have to kind of sweat it. You're going to have to, you know, it's going to bring up thorns and There'll be poisonous snakes, and you know, the, the, instead of just everything being wonderful and beautiful, it's, there's going to be parts of it that are ugly, parts of it that you have to work really hard just to stay ahead of, right? This creation there is broken now, along with humanity itself, and there are going to be times when, like a snake come out of that hole, that creation is going to come out and just bite you right in the behind, right? Hello, coronavirus. I mean, you know, it's like that is a broken creation, right, lashing out in the same way that if you were to grab a plant with a thorn on it, right, it'd stick your hand and make you bleed. The creation has made humanity bleed. But also it's about a sin against God and against one another. And there, there are two, there's a couple other details in that story that I want to call your attention to. First of all, it says that Eve took the... The forbidden fruit right she takes it and then and she says to god i did take and eat it so there's that taking right i'll come back to that there's then also it has a consequence of their rebellion against god it's a consequence of their rejection of god's loving purposes it says that their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked right it says their eyes are opened and they see the brokenness of the world. In a sense, they see each other's vulnerability. They see the capacity for suffering that is now has now been brought into the world through human rejection of God's love. Right? So there's this idea of being of taking, of, of taking something for food, the having one's eyes opened, and then they are cast out. Right of the garden at the very end of chapter three, they're cast out, and God places cherubim, angels, in front of the uh, in front of at the east of Eden, right, and in a sense out, outside of that first creation, that first part of creation, angels are placed, and there's a flaming sword, so basically a fire that keeps them out. Okay, now let's look at what happens. To Cleopas and his companion, when Jesus, the risen Jesus, comes into their lives. So I'm going to skip ahead to verse 28 for this part of the res story's resolution, right? So that story, the story of humanity's alienation from God, humanity's rejection from God's life, humanity's living in a creation that was made to be a gift but has now become a curse because of humanity's rebellion against God's love and life. Right? That needs to be resolved. Right? That, you know, it says we can't go on living that way. We can't, we can't, humanity can't go on living under, in a sense, the consequences of its sin. And so Jesus is walking with Cleopas and his companion, and 
He says, they urged him strongly. He was going to walk ahead as, he, as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. Now let's go back, and I forgot this detail. So let's go back to Genesis chapter three. So after Adam and Eve take the forbidden fruit, what time of day does God come back to find that they've rejected his love? It says, in when the evening breeze, yes, Deacon Pam is raising her hand. She knows, right? In the, when the, in the cool of the day, as the evening breeze is beginning to blow, say just about dinner time, as the day has passed, what time does Jesus come into? They say, stay with us, abide with us. And Jesus abides with them, just as God's original intention was to abide with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? in the perfect creation. Here it is in evening, and they sit down to a meal. Now, in Luke's gospel, I can't go over there because if I had like an hour, I'd do this. But in Luke's gospel, you're just going to have to take it on faith that this is the eighth meal reported in Luke's gospel. Luke has Jesus eating dinners with Pharisees, and, you know, and all the while, in all these meals, he typically does a healing, right? He restores someone to newness of life, to new creation life. This is the eighth meal on the eighth day, the day after the Sabbath, the day after the day of rest. This is the day of new creation. So Clebus and his companion, two, right? And one of the traditions is, so there, there are two different traditions. One is that this is Cleopas and his son. And another one is this Cleopas and his wife. I like the, the idea that it might be Cleopas and his wife because Adam and Eve, right, invite God into their home, abide with us, stay with us, remake us. And, they, and, Jesus, and Jesus comes in in the evening at the same time of day, they, he, what does Jesus do with the bread first? He took the bread. It's their table, right? Just as Adam and Eve is God's garden and they take what's God's, Jesus comes into their home, it's their bread, and Jesus takes it. Right? And then he breaks it and blesses it and gives it back to them as a gift. What Adam and Eve failed to do with God, that is, God wanted them to take what he had given them and for them to offer it back to God as gift. Now God takes initiative and he gives them their broken lives back again as a gift. He is in the process of remaking their lives with his love and his forgiveness. And then what happens as soon as he gives them the bread? Their eyes were opened. And now their eyes are opened not to the consequences of sin. Their eyes are open not to vulnerability and suffering, but now their eyes are open to redemption, to the possibility of God's love being victorious over death. Their eyes are opened to the victory of Jesus. Right? It's a remaking. And then, instead of a fire that keeps them out of the garden, were not our hearts aflame within us? The fire has moved inside of their hearts to bring them back into a new creation. Beloved friends, this story is for all of you who feel like you're living your life under the curse of some mistake in your past, right? There's been some brokenness back there. There's something that was done to you or you did to somebody or maybe you did to yourself, and you're dealing with the consequences of that, and you can't live that way. Your life cannot be about that anymore. You're, you, you, it needs a resolution. You're yearning for a healing, and this story is about the fact that Jesus wants to come into your life. He wants to come into your life, into your home. He wants to abide with you and remake your life from the inside out. He wants to open your eyes to the future, not to the past, not to brokenness, not to vulnerability, not to suffering. He wants to open your eyes to love and joy and peace. This is what he wants you to see now in the life that he shares with you. He wants to take your broken life and give it back to you whole again. 
give it back to you as his life being lived in you. That is the joy of this evening of Easter. Right? In a sense, God wants to take you, he wants to come back to that very moment that there's maybe there's a time, a day in your life that you live over and over and over again. Well, God will meet you there and bring you into the future. It's time to walk forward. It's time to, it's time to come into a future. So that's one of the stories of Israel that is resolved, right, and brought to a joyful and fitting conclusion in the resurrection of Jesus. The other one is the Exodus. Right? And the Exodus. And those 40 long years. Now, we don't know how exactly the story was told at the you know, in earlier times in Israel's history. What we do know is the story that we now have in the Bible was a story that they told in the exile. In a sense, it was the final form of the story that we've received. We know these are very ancient, very, a very ancient witness. But it achieved its final form in the exile in Babylon. That is to say, they knew that God had brought them out of Egypt in the land in the land of slavery and death and into the promised land, but they were back out of the promised land. In a sense, the Israelites felt that in the destruction of Jerusalem and in their exile in Babylon, God, in a sense, they were still in the wilderness. They hadn't ever really, they, they weren't home. They'd been taken back out of the wilderness. And they were living in this wilderness time, right? Wondering, when is God going to bring us home? When, when are we going to find our purpose again? They, they are in the wilderness kind of basically wandering around for 40 years before they're allowed to come in. The book of Deuteronomy ends with, in a sense, Moses being the, the quintessential unfinished story, right? Moses gets almost there, and then he dies. And, and you're supposed to feel badly for Moses because Israel felt badly for itself. Israel said, like, we're like Moses. It's like we're, we were almost there. We were almost there. And then we got pulled back again. It's like we died, and we're still here in the wilderness. We haven't crossed the Jordan. So you see this when Cleopas says to, says to the risen Jesus. Now, in the NRSV translation, it says, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But the, literally what that sentence is, is we had hoped that he was the one to set Israel free. Redemption is Exodus language. To, redemption is all about the Exodus. It's about God's redeeming his slave people. Right? So to set Israel free, we were hoping that Jesus was going to be the one who brought us home again, who gave us a purpose again, who would bring us, in a sense, to a unity to where we're not oppressed. We're not, in a sense, cowering in fear anymore. We can live the way that God wants us to live. And we're, we, have, we were hoping that Jesus was going to do that. And yet, it seems like he can't because he, he died. And so, in, and to underline this, it says, or before when it says, they, you know, when Jesus asked them what they were talking about, as they're, they're walking along the road away from Jerusalem, and Jesus says, what are you talking about? And they stop midway, right? They're neither in Jerusalem nor in Emmaus. They're in that in-between place. They're in that wilderness place. And it's there that Jesus, beginning with Moses, significant, right? Beginning with Moses, that first exodus, in other words, and all the prophets, especially the ones from the exile, who said, God's going to bring you home. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. In other words, he told them how a crucified and risen Messiah finishes the story. He was going to bring Israel's story to completion. And then, right, it says he comes home to them. He comes into their home. They break bread, which is the symbol of manna from the wilderness. So God sustaining them in that wilderness time. And then, it's, and then the fire in their hearts takes on a different meaning. And as it resolves this story, that now our hearts burning within us, as he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us, while he was telling us that our exodus, our long exile is over and we're supposed to come home to God 
and we can come home to God and live with him forever. In other words, that story, our hearts were on fire within us. Okay, quiz. How did God lead the people of Israel? Remember, this is dinner time, so it's now nighttime. So when they invite Jesus in, it's in the evening and the day is almost over. So they're having dinner. It's at night. How did God lead the people of Israel at nighttime? With a pillar of, yeah, Deacon Pam knows, right? A pillar of fire, right? Fire. We're not our hearts burning within us. The fire has moved inside of us now. God in the power of the Holy Spirit through the risen Jesus is going to lead us through the darkness of our lives, through the darkness of our fear, the darkness of our doubt and uncertainty and the vicissitudes of this life, through the darkness that the coronavirus has created, the darkness that are the uncertainty of our own lives, through losing our jobs, through our diagnoses, whatever has caused us to be in a wilderness place, to be in between, neither here nor there, but in this weird in-between place between Emmaus and Jerusalem, God meets you there and he wants to take you home. And through the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart, he wants to lead you. He wants to lead you. So where do they go when G after Jesus vanishes from their sight? They go home. They go back to Jerusalem, right? Now their home is in Emmaus, but their true home is in Jerusalem with the other disciples. They join community again. They all reassemble. It's like the Avengers. They all come back. They all come together again in one upper room. The Lord has appeared to Simon. He appeared to us too. And they told them about how he had opened the scriptures to them on the road, and, and they saw him in the breaking of the bread. They come home. The story is resolved. Jesus brings all of our stories to the satisfactory conclusion that we desire in his love. He has the power to resolve all the stories. If you come here today, if you come into this day wondering how is this ever going to be made right? How are we ever going to get through this? Or if you're just, if, if hey, when things were good, you felt that way, right? I mean, it, before the virus ever was a, you know, a glimmer on the news cycle, did you feel that you're like, how is God going to make these crooked lines go straight? How can these crooked lines, well, he's not going to make them go straight. He's going to bring them home, right? He's, he's not, he doesn't have to straighten out your path. He just has to make sure your path gets home, and he's going to bring you home. No matter what crooked road you wander down, he can bring you back to Jerusalem. He can bring you back into the community of disciples. He can make your life make sense again because he made death make sense through his resurrection. Right? Because that's, that was Cleopas and his companion. There's like, if he died, we thought we were going to be set free. We thought the story was going to come to a happy ending, and then he died, and that's it. There's no way for the story to turn out right. Jesus says that even if you die, I can make your story turn out right. This is the good news we have for all of humanity, that no matter what, how crazy the world has gone, no matter how nonsensical our lives may seem, no matter how permanent death's grip may seem to be on us, Jesus can make our lives come to a perfect conclusion in him. And he has already done so. We just have to open our eyes to it. We have to read the book of our lives again and see them coming, leading us to the Jerusalem in which we will know Jesus' love and his healing in the midst of a community of other lost people who found their way home. Amen. Loving one another, let us with one mind confess the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in essence and undivided. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, 
Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form four, found on page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ, didst destroy death and bring life and immortality to light, grant that we, who have been raised with him, may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. Through the same Jesus Christ, O Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring it everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. God's peace to all of you, St. Matthews. I'm so glad you joined us this morning, and uh, I hope that uh, this uh, service is a blessing to you. And uh, we just, uh, our announcements is uh, keep, keep an eye on our social media as we uh, lean into, as uh, if restrictions change, we don't know when that's going to happen, but we'll be making announcements that as soon as we can change the way we do ministry and in, involve more people and bring people home to our church home, we will do that.
So uh, just to keep your eyes and ears open to uh, the announcements that come through the churches, we are led by our bishop, Bishop Sumner, in uh, being having a ministry that's sustainable, which means, in the first instance, that's safe. And so we need to be able to be safe, to be sustainable. And speaking of sustainability, we also encourage all of you to uh, continue to support the cathedral um, in your stewardship and your almsgiving, uh, and so that we can be a people who support others, especially Christ's poor, in a time of uh, great need that we can all really see coming uh, in the future. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, Deacon Pam sets the table. I'll uh, do our next uh, hymn, which is hymn number 178. Hallelujah, hallelujah, give thanks to the risen Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, give praise to his name. Jesus is Lord of all the earth. He is the King of creation. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. Spread the good news over all the earth. Jesus has died and has risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Give praise to his name. We have been crucified with Christ. Now we shall live forever. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. Oh, let us praise the living God. Joyfully sing to our Savior. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light and accessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. 
You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us in a covenant with you. And through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only son to be our savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death. And rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you as Heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup, we praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us, and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember our Bishop George and all who minister in your church, Remember all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and light. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with Blessed Matthew and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. All honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. And now, as the Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them and remember that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.